Coming up on Discovering the Jewish Jesus Today, beloved ones, I'm going to teach on how anti-Semitism led to the separation of the movements of Judaism and Christianity. Stay tuned for this important broadcast. Rabbi Schneider is a voice crying out in our lost world, pointing mankind to Jesus today. Shalom, I'm Cynthia, Rabbi's wife. I pray that Father God touches you and blesses you today as Rabbi Schneider teaches and preaches God's Word. How did Christianity and Judaism become separate from each other? Jesus is the aim to which the Hebrew Scriptures spoke of. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion, but he came to make Jew and Gentile one in Messiah. And what the Father wants to do is help Jewish people understand that believing in Jesus is not an un-Jewish thing. And he wants the church to appreciate the Jewish roots of her heritage. God bless you and shalom, beloved ones. My name is Rabbi Schneider. Welcome today to Discovering the Jewish Jesus. We are continuing our journey in exploring how Judaism as a movement and Christianity separated from each other. I really want to encourage you, go get this entire series. It's really enlightening and important information. I'm not going to review right now. I'm just going to launch right back in to where I left off last week. We're talking about how anti-Semitism caused Christianity and Judaism as movements to separate, it from, to separate from each other. Now, when I say as movements, because the term Judaism isn't in the Bible, and the term Christianity isn't in the Bible. Neither of those terms are actually biblical terms. So when we say Judaism, that is a term that is meant to describe those that follow what we call the Old Testament, but what Jewish people call the Tanakh. So Judaism is a term that represents the community of religious Jewish people by and large that are relating to God entirely through the revelation of the Tanakh. Okay, that's a very, very general statement. So let me say again, the term Jew is a biblical term. You know, salvation's from the Jews, Jesus said in John 4, 22. But Judaism is a term that is not a biblical term, but is a term that is used to describe the religion of the Jews. Not all Jews, because I'm a Jew. I believe in Jesus, okay? I'm not following traditional or orthodox Judaism. I'm following the one that I believe to be the king of the Jews. So, in traditional Judaism... I am looked at as a, 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 a someone that uh, is a heretic because I believe in Jesus, even someone they say that's no longer Jewish because I believe in Jesus. And yet we know that Jesus came as a Jew, lived as a Jew, celebrated Passover. His disciples were all Jews. Did you know that at the end of the book of Acts, Paul said about himself that he said, I am a Pharisee, Paul said, the son of Pharisees. So Paul saw himself as totally Jewish. He still saw himself as a Pharisee. He never saw himself as someone that was no longer Jewish, someone that was a Christian and not a Jew. He saw himself as a Jew that was following the king of the Jews, the prophesied Messiah, Jesus, okay? So I just got done saying the term Judaism is not a biblical term, but it's just an expression that man has used to describe the religion of the Jewish community in general. And the word Christianity is also not a biblical term, but the word Christianity is used to describe the belief system of those that have put their faith in the Christ. And the word Christ, obviously, is used in the New Testament. It is a term, it's a Greek term, and it means the anointed one. So when uh, I say that I'm a Christian, it really has nothing to do with being Jewish because 
being Jewish is something that I was born into. In other words, I was born a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jewish boys, right, according to the Word of God, according to the Torah, Paul said this about himself in the book of Philippians, Jewish boys are circumcised as Israelites or Jews, get it now, the eighth day. So you see, being a Jew or being an Israelite doesn't have to do with our belief system. It has to do with our ancestry. People are circumcised the eighth day, boys, when they're a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you're born a Jew, it's being born into an ancestry. But being a Christian is not about ancestry. You're not born a Christian. You become a Christian when you decide to pick up your cross one day and follow Jesus. So the word Christ is in the New Testament. And the word Christian is in the New Testament. It's used three times, and it describes those that are following the Christ. But the word Christianity as a term is not in the New Testament. But the word Christianity, like the term Judaism, is a general term that is a man-made term that is used to describe those that are following the Christ. Well, I hope that makes sense. We're talking about how these two movements of Judaism and Christianity separated from each other. And one of the elements that I began to touch on last week that has caused a separation and a divide between the two movements is anti-Semitism. In the 300s, the emperor of Rome, Constantine, said he had a vision of a cross. And he inferred from that vision that he was to conquer in the name of Christ. And he unified his kingdom under now what he believed to be Christianity because he saw a vision of the cross. So here now, the largest Christian quote, I'm using that term loosely now because it's under Constantine, the largest Christian influence in the world, listen now, was an anti-Semitic movement because Constantine was an anti-Semite. He actually made it illegal for people under his government to work for Jewish people unless the Jewish people had become Christians. And so think about this. Constantine becomes, quote, the leader of Christianity. I'm not saying beloved in a spiritual sense, but I'm saying in an earthly sense. Here now, the leader of Christianity in the known world, Constantine, who is also an anti-Semite, he's breathing anti-Semitism into the people that he is calling to Christ. And so what happens? An anti-Semitic spirit is birth now in a huge way into Christianity. We already talked about some of the other influences earlier, the influence of the Pharisees that persecuted Jesus and their influence uh, in all this. But this is a different type of, of, of influence. This is anti-Semitism coming from the greatest first leader of, quote, the church, not the real church, but in loose terms, the church. And so Christianity becomes an anti-Semitic movement. This mindset of anti-Semitism that Constantine breathed into the church becomes so evident as time goes on. For example, one of the continual uh, 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 leaders of the church, one of the forefathers uh, around Constantine's time, was a leader by the name of John Chrysostom. And there are still churches today within Catholicism that are named after John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom that uh, lived from like 349 to 407 A.D., uh, preached what is known today as 10 sermons against the Jews. And these sermons issued forth such hatred against the Jewish people, causing division between Christians and Jews. He just spewed out such hatred towards Jewish people. It's leading to a huge separation between Christianity and Judaism and Jewish people. I mean, People my father's age, beloved ones, would walk down the street, they'd be called the Christ killers. They, they'd be called all kinds of dirty names. Why? Because of the anti-Semitism that was breathed into the church, beginning with Constantine, then continuing on with John Chrysostom, and perhaps the one that you're most familiar with that's responsible for this is, believe it or not, the Saint Martin Luther. Martin Luther, listen now, who's responsible for birthing the Protestant Reformation, right? Martin Luther is the one that uh, rejected some of the Catholic practices, for example, of selling salvation, which is known as indulgences, and keeping a revelation from the people. Martin Luther rebelled against this, 
And he said, it's only scripture, salvations by grace through faith alone. And his leadership birthed the Protestant Reformation. Well, Martin Luther, that was responsible for so much good, was also beloved. He became eventually an anti-Semite. And he said that their, the Jewish people's synagogues should be burned and their rabbis should be, should be fra, uh, flailed or beaten. And this influence of Martin Luther spread through the Christian world and it became so predominant that during uh, uh, the Holocaust in, in Europe, Hitler's picture was hung in many churches there. Why? Because the church was so anti-Semitic. You know, without anti-Semitism having taken such a foothold in the church, the Holocaust of six million Jews through Nazi Germany could have never happened. It's no wonder today that Jewish people are afraid of or, uh, or uh, uh, leery of, is probably a better word, of Christians that say they love them because so much damage has been done to the Jewish people through, quote, the church because of all the anti-Semitism, beloved, that was in the church. And obviously, this led to a huge separation between traditional Judaism and the movement of Christianity. Again, Christianity was immersed with anti-Semitism. And this anti-Semitism is further evidenced in what we call today a theological term, it's known as a replacement theology. And perhaps some of you have been exposed to this in your own church. Replacement theology says this, that the promises that once belonged to Israel, no longer they say these promises belong to Israel, they teach because they say because the Jewish people rejected Jesus. And so what the people that teach anti-Semitism, uh, 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 replacement theology teaches that the promises that once were given to Israel have been taken away from Israel, they teach, and are now given to the church since the Jews rejected Jesus. It's just a form of anti-Semitism. Because what the New Testament tells us in the book of Romans is that the gift and calling of God upon the Jewish people is irrevocable, that, the, that they're still beloved of the Father. But again, much of the church has been taught anti, a, a replacement theology, much of the church, again, has been taught this replacement theology that God has rejected the Jewish people, that God's done with the Jewish people, that God no longer has a destiny for the Jewish people. Much of the church has been taught this replacement theology because of anti-Semitic roots that began with Constantine, continued on through the church fathers like John Chrysostom, went as far as Martin Luther, the founder of the Reformation. I remember the first time I went to Israel I went with a group of pastors, and I won't even mention what denomination this one pastor on the group with me was from, but he was part of one of the mainline churches in the Western world, a denomination that you're all familiar with. And he knew I was Jewish. And we're sitting down to eat one day, and this pastor says to me, yeah, uh, Paul met Jesus, and he came away with pork on his breath. I mean, such an offensive thing to say to me as a Jew. Whether I keep kosher or not, it's just a replacement theology, anti-Semitic type of comment that he would have to say such a thing. It's, again, this concept that, you know, God no longer has anything to do with anything Jewish. He's taken that all away. God's done with all that. He's all for the church now. And I pray, beloved ones, that if you have been taught that, that Father would deliver you from that right now. God still has a special call upon the Jewish people. He still has a special call on the nation of Israel. And we have to respect that and honor that. Paul told us that in the book of Romans. He says, don't become arrogant, Paul said, against the root that supports you. Because the scriptures come from Israel and Jesus himself is a Jew. So we shouldn't be arrogant against Jewish things, but we should be appreciative and honor that which has come to us through the Jewish people the nation, and the nation of Israel. Even heaven's going to be a Jewish place, right? The city of heaven is called the New Jerusalem, whose gates are inscribed, or the Bible tells us, with the 12 tribes of Israel as well as the 12 Jewish apostles. So I hope that through this series, beloved ones, you have come to understand 
how Jesus never came to start a new religion. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets as he clearly stated in Matthew 5, 17 and 18. But because mankind messes things up and obscures things and confuses things, we have a lot of confusion today. And we went back to the beginning and we traced how this confusion today came. We shouldn't be confused. Jewish people should understand that believing in Jesus is the most Jewish thing that a Jew could do because Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, that he himself bore our sin in his own body on the tree. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord laid upon him, meaning Yeshua, the iniquity of us all, and by his scourging we are healed. You see, Peter said, Jesus is the one that Moses spoke of. You see, Peter said, Jesus is the one that was revealed in the Torah, when it was written in the Torah, when the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to raise up from your brethren, Moses, a deliverer like you from amongst your kinsmen. Peter said, the one that God was referring to when he said that to Moses is Jesus. Jesus said in John 5, he said to the Jewish people, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for Moses wrote of me. So my heart's desire, I'm endeavoring to help Jewish people understand that believing in Jesus is entirely Jewish because he is the prophesied Hebrew Messiah. He is the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. Remember he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish but fulfill. Then conversely, I want to say to the church, don't look at Judaism as some foreign religion you actually are birthed out of Judaism. Jesus came as a Jew, lived as a Jew, died as a Jew, hung on the cross as the king of the Jews, sits in heaven right now as the lion from the tribe of Judah, and he's coming back, beloved ones, as the offspring of David. So honor this and appreciate the Jewish roots of your faith. Learn more. Don't, don't, don't be, be anti-Semitic. Don't separate yourself from Jewish believers. Don't, uh, you know, so many times I think the church, because they don't have this information, they're afraid of it and what they're afraid of they try to diminish so there's a lot of people that talk bad about you know congregations that practice some of the Hebrew roots out of fear and insecurity don't be like that I've just given you all the information let's embrace the truth no matter how it affects us we need to pick up a cross deny ourselves, and follow Jesus and what I've given you beloved is spirit and truth so over the course of the last episodes, I don't know how many this is right now, the last several months, we've talked about how the Pharisees of Jesus' day rejected Jesus because of their jealousy. And that began the divide. And then we continued on and we talked about how when Jesus said he and the Father were one, because the Jewish leadership of Jesus' day couldn't understand how a man could say he was one with God, again, they got so upset they tore their clothes. They called him a blasphemer, which again began to cause division between the traditional Jewish religion of Jesus' day and himself. And then we looked at how in John's gospel he uses the term Jew sometimes in a negative light because he's not referring to the Jewish people in general, but he's referring their beloved ones to the religious Judean leadership that had rejected Jesus. And we took a look at that in John's gospel. And then we continued on and we looked at the difference between the oral law and the written law. We looked at Mark chapter 7 and Exodus 24 and we shared how the fact that Jesus said that much of the oral law or some of the oral law was just the tradition of men. And since the Pharisees of Jesus' day and Orthodox Jews today believe that the oral law came from God and Jesus called it the tradition of men, there was even a further divide between the traditional Jewish movement and the movement uh, comprising of those that are following the Jewish Messiah. And then we looked at the phenomenon of the inclusion of the Gentiles. That when the church began to receive Gentiles, that created a bigger division between the traditional Jews and the church. Because traditional Jews, we read in Acts chapter 10, don't associate closely with Gentiles. Well, God put an end to all that, but for the Jewish people that haven't received that revelation, they were further uh, moving away from Jewish people that did because they couldn't see how associating with Gentiles could be a good thing.
And then we looked at the revolts uh, in, in, 70, in 66 AD, leading to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and then the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132. And we talked about how the Jewish people's revolt against the Romans led to a further division. And beloved, there were many other things in this series as well. I really would encourage you, get this entire series and study this information. It's really fascinating. And listen, if you want to study history, the best history to study is church history. And that's what we've done over the last several months. I want to say, beloved ones, I've tried to make this as simple as possible. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I love you. And I want to simply close today by saying this. I'm Jewish. Most of you that are watching are Gentiles, although we have Jewish people that are watching too. In closing, I want to say this. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion, but he came to make Jew and Gentile one in Messiah. God is not the God of the Jews only. He's God of all humankind that he's created in his own image. And he sent us Yeshua the Messiah to bring us all to himself. He loves you today, beloved ones, and he's coming back for us soon. I love you today. This is Rabbi Schneider saying, Shalom. Beloved, as we're seeing in this series, it began in Israel. But I want you to hear this. It's also going to end in Israel. Just as Jesus came out of Jerusalem, beloved, he's going to return to the world through Jerusalem. I want you to hear me very carefully. Jesus will not return until there's a mass of Jewish people living on the earth that believe in him and are calling upon him to return. This is why Paul said in the book of Romans, if the Gentiles were blessed when the Jews rejected the gospel, he said, how much more will the Gentiles be blessed when the Jews receive the gospel? Beloved, listen to me. When Jewish people receive Jesus and begin to call upon him to return, there's going to be a critical mass of them that will bring in, usher in his return. The Lord recently opened up a door for me to preach the gospel on the ground in Jerusalem. I had over 500 Jewish people that did not know the Lord and heard the gospel for the first time. After I preached to them, beloved, the good news of Messiah Yeshua, you know what? Over a hundred of them stood up and prayed to receive Jesus as their Messiah. And you know what? It couldn't have happened without you. I want to thank you for your love and for your financial support. I want to encourage you to continue to invest in me, to continue to invest in this ministry. God has given me cutting edge strategies to reach the nation of Israel with the gospel. Beloved, their salvation is bound to your salvation because when Jewish people once again receive Jesus as Messiah, Jesus will return and you and I will see him face to face. Remember the Lord said, blessed are those that pray for the peace of Jerusalem and there will not be peace there until they know Messiah Jesus as Lord. Discovering the Jewish Jesus is a cutting edge ministry that's reaching Israel with the gospel and we need your financial support to do it. Thank you so much for your love. God bless you and in Yeshua's name, Shalom. Here's how you can partner with us. Send your tax deductible gift to Discovering the Jewish Jesus P.O. Box 777, Blissfield, Michigan, 49228. To make a credit card donation, call 1-800-777-7835 or text the keyword rabbi to 45777. To donate securely online, go to discoveringthejewishjesus.com. To show our appreciation, we will send you an audio CD of Rabbi Schneider's Message of the Month, as well as our most recent newsletter. To learn more about this ministry and for more information about Rabbi Schneider's rich spiritual resources or Messianic music by Joshua James, go to discoveringthejewishjesus.com. Do you have a testimony of how the Lord has used Discovering the Jewish Jesus to change your life? We invite you to share it with us. Visit us at discoveringthejewishjesus.com and click on the testimonies link. Dear Rabbi Schneider, thank you so much for your teachings. Sometimes when you close your program, it's like Jesus' eyes are looking at me with his love. Praise his holy name, peace to you and yours. Sandy from Wyoming. We're glad you joined us today and we want to pray for you 
Send us your prayer request by mail or by visiting us at discoveringthejewishjesus.com. We also want to thank you for your prayers and financial support. In supporting Discovering the Jewish Jesus, you become a partner with God in building His kingdom. Thank you, and may our Father pour abundantly back into your life as you partner together with us. In the book of Numbers, chapter 6, Father God spoke to Moses and said, Have Aaron speak this blessing over my people, and I will place my name upon them and bless them. Beloved child of God, I want you to receive your Father's blessing for you right now. Yahweh, Yahweh, Ya er Yahweh penave lecha vichunecha Yisa Yahweh penave lecha veasem lecha Shalom. Your Father will bless you and keep you. Father will make His face shine on you, and He will continue to be gracious to you. Your Father will lift you up with His countenance continually, and He will ever be strengthening you in His peace, beloved child of God. Many of you are feeling something mysterious right now. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. He loves you and he wants to come in and live inside you. All you have to do is say, Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. I believe that you died on the cross for me and I'm asking you now to come and live inside me. Beloved one, if you've said that prayer and in your heart, you've turned your life over to Jesus and you're ready to follow him, I want you to know he is going to change your life. Now, if you just made that decision, there's information on the screen. Would you let us know? God bless you. I love you and shalom. Experience discovering the Jewish Jesus, how you want and when you want. View Rabbi's weekly devotional, Seeds of Revelation on Facebook. Watch full episodes on YouTube. Download Rabbi's Teaching on our mobile app and read special letters from Cynthia or send a prayer request to our website. Stay connected with one of our many free resources today. Beloved, we've come to a close on our series on how Judaism and Christianity separated. It is a very unique and special series and the information contained therein is hard to find. I want to encourage you, consider purchasing it for your library.